And with regard to cell phone use, uh, there's some, a very important fact of science, and that is the act of measurement, it, it's a fascinating thing, measurement, because you can never measure anything precisely, you can, that is, with unlimited precision. You can only measure it with the uncertainties of your measuring device. And all you can do in the lab is try to constrain how uncertain that measurement is, but at some level it will always be uncertain. And here's what happens. If there is, if you're trying to measure a phenomenon that does not exist, the variations in your measurement will occasionally give you a positive signal as well as a negative signal. If that positive signal is the idea that maybe A causes B, in this case cell phones cause cancer, a paper gets written about that result and then people, people get concerned that cell phones might cause cancer or power lines might cause cancer. This goes way back. And so, in fact, if you look at the full spate of these studies, even those that they thought not to publish because it was not a positive effect, there's some cases where, in fact, there's less cancer. And so these are the phenomenon of a no result. When you actually have A causing B, the signal is huge. It is huge and it's repeatable in time and in place. With cell phones, that repeatable signal is yet to be emerge from the total experiments that are done on it. That being said, if you're worried, almost every cell phone you can, you know, they have the, the cell phones on your hip and you've got an earpiece. So just do that if you're worried. But uh, otherwise, we, I can either say the jury is still out or the experimental results are consistent with no effect at all. We got the Big Bang. That's been going for a while. Now, not everybody's happy with the Big Bang. You found, found this billboard. So, so, so apparently, God isn't happy with the Big Bang. I would have thought he'd be totally cool with it, but apparently not. Our, I found this bumper sticker in New Mexico. The Big Bang Theory, God spoke, bang, it happens. So this one is okay with the Big Bang, but that God did the Big Bang. So people are still trying to wrestle with this. Uh, here's what we know. This is the entire universe in one slide. Quantum fluctuations, birth, an entire explosion, rapid explosion. Rapid expansion, we call it inflation. That's an idea that came about in the 1970s when there was inflation, <laughs> severe inflation in our economy. So the word had a lot of currency back then. Now it's like, are you inflating a tire? Like, what are you doing, you know? Um, there is the, the baby picture of the universe. That's that sort of aqua surface there. That's sort of the imprint of what happened in the very earliest moments, writ in the background sky. There it is, the cosmic microwave background, a record of the earliest moments of the Big Bang. Then it takes a little time to make your first stars. We call it the dark ages. Stars are made, galaxies are made, galaxies mature. We come up to the present day, 13.7 billion years later, and that telescope we can't see the whole name, it's called WMAP, Wilkinson Microwave Anisotropy Probe. They clearly didn't want anyone to pronounce that or remember it. <laughs> I would just call it the Big Bang Machine. Uh, that made this measurement. And so it's a pretty coherent picture that we have of the origin of the universe. And here's that map that the, the uh, space probe shown. And so this is a record of the earliest moments of the universe. And it tells us what the universe was up to. And data, agree we're all pretty happy with this and we're kind of moving on. People say, well, have you found life yet? No, well, there, you know, that's like going to the ocean, this has been said before, taking a cup of water, scooping up and say, there are no whales in the ocean, you know? <laughs> Here's my data, you know? <laughs> you, you need a slightly bigger sample. If you look at the chemical ingredients of life itself, uh, you remember from biology class, we're mostly water. And good old water is H2O. Two hydrogens, one oxygen. And if you could look at the sort of the element budget of life, hydrogen is number one, as expressed in the water molecule. The number two in the human body is oxygen. 
turns out. Number three in the human body is carbon. Four is nitrogen. Five, you find on all lists, is other. Okay, <laughs> now if you go to the universe, <laughs> That's the O on the periodic table. You didn't know that? <laughs> <laughs> That's not for oxygen, it's for other. Um, so, you go into the universe, number one ingredient in the universe is hydrogen. That was true in life. Number two in the ingredient in the universe is helium. We don't have that yeah, one. Yeah, it doesn't, nope. doesn't like but, anybody. Now, how come? Well, because helium is chemically inert. You can't do anything with it even if you wanted. No, you can inhale it, okay? <laughs> and sound like Mickey Mouse, yes. Next in the universe is oxygen. Next, carbon. Next, other. Thank you, in the third <laughs> row there. So, actually that was the second row. They must be related to the second row here. We are one for one matchup with the most abundant ingredients in the universe. Of these, carbon is the most chemically fertile element in the entire periodic table. You can make more kinds of molecules with carbon than all other molecules combined. So, if you were going to experiment through the forces of nature with complex chemistry, and you had to pick an element to base it on, carbon is your man, or your woman, however that goes. Okay, so, what I'm saying is, Given, the, given the, what carbon is capable of doing, perhaps we shouldn't be so surprised that there's life because we are carbon-based life. We're just another one of the things carbon has rolled up its sleeve. Maybe life is inevitable given the abundance of carbon and oxygen and nitrogen and hydrogen in the universe. I'm try, try to invert that view. Otherwise, you're left thinking, hey, we're special. You know how you know I would give you right to say you're special? If life on Earth were made of an isotope of bismuth. <laughs> <laughs> that stuff is nowhere in the, in the cosmos. And then we're made of it, we're special. Okay, but if we're the most common ingredients of the ingredients of the, of the matter that we know and love, you don't have an argument. Um, I read a book. Constellation of Philosophy. The main guy, Boethius, is condemned to death. He has everything taken from him. All he has is his reason and his sense of self. Not even that. But he attempts to console himself to this execution by reasoning that the world has order, that there is something that keeps things together. And he uses his reason to try and get to the root of why he should be at peace at death. The problem is, his source of origin is a belief in God. What would you do? <laughs> well, I, I don't know if I fully understand the question. I do know that uh, if he's about to be executed... Uh, How about you are about to be executed? Oh, I'm about to be executed. You have nothing except your knowledge and your, your knowledge of science, your experience. I would request that my body in death be buried, not cremated, so that the energy content contained within it gets returned to the earth so that flora and fauna can dine upon it just as I have dined upon flora and fauna throughout my life. Do I believe in UFOs or extraterrestrial visitors? I'm not authorized to answer that question. <laughs> um, where shall I begin? Um, UFO, first, remember what the U stands for in UFO. Now, there's a fascinating frailty of the human mind that psychologists know all about, and it's called argument from ignorance. And this is how it goes. You ready? 
Somebody sees lights flashing in the sky. They've never seen it before. They don't understand what it is. They say, a UFO. The U stands for unidentified. So they say, I don't know what it is. It must be aliens from outer space visiting from another planet. <laughs> well, if you don't know what it is, that's where your conversation should stop. <laughs> you don't then say, it must be anything. Okay? That's what argument from ignorance is. It's common. I'm not blaming anybody. Psychologists know all about it. And it may relate to our burning need to have to know stuff because we're uncomfortable steeped in ignorance. You can't be a scientist if you're uncomfortable with ignorance because we live at the boundary between what is known and unknown in the universe. Unlike what journalists write, you ever see journalists? They, any journalists here? <laughs> you go to journalists. <laughs> you go to journalists. All articles about science discoveries begin. Scientists now have to go back to the drawing board. As though we're sitting up in our office, you know, <laughs> masters of the universe. It's like, oops, somebody discovered something. No, we're always at the drawing board. If you're not at the drawing board, you're not making discoveries. You're something else. So, the public, it appears, seems to have this burning need to have to have an answer to what is unknown. And so you go from an abject statement of ignorance to an abject statement of certainty. So, that is operating within us. Let's start there. Second, we know, not only from research in psychology, but simple empirical evidence in the history of science, that the lowest form of evidence that exists in this world is eyewitness testimony. <laughs> Which is scary because that's some of the highest form of evidence in the court of law. But we know from second grade, where's my guy from second grade? Okay, get up to the microphone for a minute. Look, grab the microphone, grab the microphone. In your classes, have you done the famous experiment where you play telephone? and you line up all your kids in class, and one person starts with a story, and then you hear it and you repeat it to the next person, and the next person, have you done that in class yet? Yes. You've done that, because what, hap what happens by the time you get to the last person, and they retell the story, what happens? It's like completely different. It's completely different! <laughs> completely different, okay? Because the conveyance of information was relying on eyewitness testimony, which in that case is ear witness testimony. And so, let's oh, thank you. So, so we know that. So he knows it. He's in second grade. All right. So, actually, he should be in 12th grade, as we've established. <laughs> so, so now, so now, it wouldn't matter if you saw a flying saucer. In science, even if you have something less controversial than a flying saucer, if you come into my lab and you say, you gotta believe me, I saw it, and you're one of my fellow scientists, I say, I say go, go, back, go home. <laughs> go back until you have some other kind of evidence that's not just, you saw it, okay? Because human perception system is rife with all ways of getting it wrong, okay? But we don't like thinking of ourselves that way. We have high opinions of our human biology when in fact we should not. I'll give you an example of how it reveals itself. We've all bought and enjoyed books called, called um, uh, Optical Illusions, right? Well, we all love optical illusions, but that's not what they should call the book. They should call them brain failures, okay? Because that's what it is. It is a complete failure of human perception. All right? All it takes is a few sketches that are cleverly done. Your brain can't figure it out. All right? So, we are poor data-taking devices. That's why we have such a thing as science, because we have machines that don't, don't care what side of the bed they woke up in the morning, don't care what they said to their spouse that day, doesn't care whether they had their morning caffeine. They'll get the data right, okay? So, maybe you did see visitors from another part of the galaxy. I need more than your eyewitness testimony. And in modern times, I need more than your photograph. 
which Photoshop probably has a UFO button today. <laughs> like, stick it in, right? <laughs> so, <laughs> on your computer. So, here's, the, here's, the, here's what you do. I'm not saying we haven't been visited. I'm saying the evidence thus far brought forth does not satisfy the standards of evidence that any scientist would require for any other claim that you're going to walk into the lab with. So here's what I recommend. Here's what I recommend. Next time you're abducted, because I'm ready for this. I'm ready, OK? I get abducted. I'm ready, OK? So you're there. You're like on the slab, because they always do like the sex experiments on you, on the flying saucer. So there you are, and they're poking at you. So here's what you do. You ready? You tell the alien, you'll be an alien for this, right? So you're poking me, all right? So then Finally, I say. Finally, I'm on this side of the equation. Okay, so I say, hey, look over there. And then he looks over there, you quickly like snatch something off the shelf, put it in a pocket, and then lay back. All right? <laughs> then, then you're done, you come back, and say, look what I got. Okay, I like stole the ashtray off the shelf of the flying saucer. And then you bring that to the lab. And it's not about eyewitness testimony at that point, because you'll have something of alien manufacture. And anything you pull off of a flying saucer that crossed the galaxy is going to be interesting. Okay? Because even objects within our own culture. I got this a device here, okay, the iPhone. Ten years ago, they would have resurrected the witch-burning laws had you pulled this thing out, okay? <laughs> and that's in our own culture. Our own culture produced this over a ten-year span. So if, you, if there's some uh, technology that crossed the galaxy, that's going to be some serious stuff to look at in the lab. Then we can have the conversation. Until then, I can't, I'm sorry. Go ahead, keep trying to find them. I'm not going to stop you. But. Get ready for that time you are abducted because I'm gonna be looking for your evidence when that happens. And and what my I know, and last point on that is there are people who have looked up who look up all the time. Like for example, the community of amateur astronomers in the world. I was an amateur astronomer. We look up we come out of a building, we look up. Doesn't matter, we're we looking up. UFO sightings are not higher among amateur astronomers than they are in the general public. In fact, they're lower. You say, well, why is that so? Well, because we know what the hell we're looking at. We know. <laughs> do you know? Do you? I don't. <laughs> because we study this stuff. Do you know there was a UFO sighting reported by a police officer because we think that because you have a badge or you're a pilot or you're whatever, that your testimony is somehow better than that of an average person. It's all bad because we're human, okay? so. There was a police officer who was tracking a UFO that was swaying back and forth in the sky, okay? Reported on the, on the hot, they're in, a, in one of the, what do you call the car? The squad car chasing a UFO, and the UFO's moving back and forth like this, okay? Later it turned out the cop car was chasing Venus, and he was driving on a curved road. <laughs> but was so distracted by Venus, he thought Venus was the one moving, and he wasn't even thinking that he was doing this. So, I have seen things which, without my background in meteorology and astronomy and looking up, I would have reported to the police department. I would have. Like orographic clouds that form above huge mountains that are circular and they're above a tall mountain, which means wherever you are, the sun can set for you before it has set for the cloud, darkening the skies, yet the cloud is now illuminated by sunset colors, which are what? Red, yellow, orange, and, so, and it's circular. There have been reports of hovering circular UFOs with light beams on them because people are looking at this cloud formation on top of mountains. So, maybe we have been visited by aliens. Maybe they've even landed. But why do they land in like the farmer's yard and not like Times Square, all right? And then I worry, like maybe they had landed in Times Square, but nobody took notice. Nobody you know, because that, that's, that's the really big problem there. And so, what, so this is a huge answer to it because there's a lot built into that. So, here's another concern I had. 
Oh, you said about movies earlier? You remember Close Encounters of the Third Kind? Absolutely. You remember that? And the aliens come in this big flying saucer? Sure. Okay, and what do we do? We turn on runway lights for it. I'm thinking, <laughs> flying saucers don't need runway lights. They're flying saucers, for goodness sake. Now, if you put anything, put a bullseye or something. You did need them when we landed on the moon. Don't put runway lights for this thing? Then, when you go to Roswell and there's like crashed flying saucers, I'm thinking, if the alien came across the galaxy, and couldn't land a damn spaceship, I don't want to meet the aliens. They're stupid <laughs> aliens, all right? You can land on Earth, for goodness sake. Don't tell me you came across a galaxy, you can't land on Earth. Go home, bring me somebody who can, then I'll have the conversation. Anyhow, so those are my opinions on the subject. <laughs> <laughs>
in the Martian terrain. There's the Valentine crater, there you go. We got one of those. How about the smiley face crater, right? <laughs> so if you look hard enough, you can find stuff and call it whatever you want. 1920s, which was a watershed decade in the history of science. In that decade, we discovered that not only our galaxy, the Milky Way, is not the only existence of anything in the universe, that there are other Milky Ways out there. That recently? 1920s. Did, was it just the op optics didn't exist for that? We needed a big enough telescope, and Edwin Hubble wielded all the glass that necessary to accomplish that back in the 1920s. He said Hubble, before the telescope, was a man and, <laughs> and had his own telescope, the biggest of its day, and he made that discovery that there were these spiral fuzzy things in the night sky, we thought they were just local to us, the whole other systems of stars, 100 billion stars unto itself, outside of our system. Not only was that discovered in 1926, 1929 he discovers that the universe is expanding, which means it may have had a big, back then, it may have had a beginning. If it's expanding, that meant it was littler in the past. Well, there must have been a day when it was all together in the same place, thus was born the Big Bang. Okay, so now, also in that decade, quantum, quantum mechanics, quantum physics was discovered. That is the science of the small, the science of electrons, protons, neutrons, particles, nuclei. At the time, you'd say, this is just the, this is just physicist burning tax money. Because who cares about the atom? I got my horse to feed. I got kids, I got, you know, you got issues in society. Yet it's quantum mechanics that is the entire foundation of our technological revolution. There would be no computers. There would be no, there would be none of what you take for granted. Your iPod, your iPhone, cell phones, the space program, without our understanding of the laws of physics as they operate on that atomic and molecular and nuclear level. And so the, the, the chemist has no understanding of the periodic table of elements without quantum mechanics. To them, it's just a list of elements. Quantum mechanics tells you why this column is there, and that's there, why this mates with that, and why that makes a molecule with that. That's quantum mechanics, and it's unheralded. You ask me if there's any discovery that has changed how we live, it is quantum mechanics. And I make, I make this point because I'm ready to... Today, you hear people saying, why are we spending money up there when we've we got problems on Earth? And, we, and people don't connect. The time delay between the frontier of scientific research and how that's going to transform your life later down the line. So they, all they want is a quarterly report that shows the product that comes out of it. That is so short-sighted that that's the beginning of the end of your culture. So it's... Since you are the future, I want you to understand something and not forget it. Are you ready? Okay. Religions all over the world constitutes what we call belief systems, okay? And your freedom to believe whatever you want is a right and even a privilege in a free society. That's a good thing. Consider, however, that if you believe something that's part of a religious philosophy, and someone else has a different religion that's a different religious philosophy, and you're not agreeing with one another. And there's another religion over here, and another over here, and they don't agree. You're still free to believe what you want. But what that tells you is that it is unstable to build a government on a belief system. What you want is, what you want is objectively verifiable truths around which we can all agree. That's what you build your economic system on, your governance on. Once you have that, then you go forth to your mosques, to your churches, and to your Go forth and preach and believe whatever you want. But know the difference, as Galileo did, between how to go to heaven and how the heavens go. That's why they're, they're embedded in belief systems. And what I look at is I see all the belief systems, and when you line them up, they're not really compatible with one another. So whatever they're believing, it can't be a truth that applies to everybody because other people believe what they do with no less 
fervor. And so I sit back and, as a person who's interested in, ob in objective truths and I say, well, it doesn't look like that's a path towards an objective truth. So let people continue to think and say what they want. But as a citizen of a country that is not founded on a, on a, on a, on a religion, it's founded with, with sort of a secular construct in a way that protects whatever religion you want to express. This is protected in the Constitution. The Constitution doesn't actually mention God. Right. R rather controversial in its day. And the, the, it doesn't mention God because they don't want legislation to tell you what God to worship. They knew this. They knew how governments can persecute people who had belief systems that didn't agree with the state. They knew this. So they created those freedoms. And so we have these freedoms. Go ahead. But if you're going to create legislation that has to apply to everybody, and you're now going to put your belief system into legislation, that is not a free and open democracy. CERN, this is where they have the famous Large Hadron Collider. This is like, they're, they're, they're at the limits. It is the highest energy ever attained on Earth. Uh, and by the way, we would have done three times this energy had Congress not cut the funding for the superconducting super collider that would have been built in Texas. That was cut back in, ninth, in the early 90s, right around just after peace broke out in Europe, by the way. <laughs> Physicists are only really useful when we're at war, according to government funding patterns. So they're looking for the Higgs boson and, uh, and anything else that shows up on the docket. The Higgs boson is a particle that gives mass to other particles. So it's kind of cool. Some people have called it the God particle, and including physicists. What are they doing over in China? Well, they're building the largest dam in the world, the Three Gorges Dam, and they have a burgeoning aerospace industry growing at 14% a year, 13% a year. The economy is growing at 10% a year. By the way, what's your interest rate you're getting on your savings account in your bank? Okay. <laughs> Did you get that over here? These get, well, if you go to this other bank, you get 0.005, you know? Yeah, so other countries, different things are happening. Do you know that in Russia, they want to actually send a mission to deflect Apophis? They actually are prepared to fund that. That picture that I drew and did my little dance, that's not funded. That's just ideas on a page. Russia actually wants to fund it. And they invited us to participate. And I said, well, sure. But then I thought about it. I was asked by the news hour, what are my top 10 news stories of the year? This was now end of 2009. What are my top 10? I said, I don't have 10 stories. I have five. OK, what are they? I said, one of them is Russia inviting us to join them to deflect Apophis. They said, why? I said, Here's why. <laughs> why is Russia creating the spaceship that's going to deflect Apophis, which, if it hits, wipes out the west coast of the United States? Aren't we the ones who are supposed to fund that mission and then invite others to participate? Isn't this how it has always been before? So that was an important news story for me because that is the beginning of the end. That's where you think you're at the top and people start doing things on their own with or without you. And all of a sudden, you, not all of a sudden, you gradually fade to insignificance on the world stage. That was writing on the wall for me when we were not leading that mission. Let's keep going. How about Brazil? If I mention Brazil, what's the first thing you think of? Someone said, bikinis. bikinis. <laughs> the guys are saying, yeah, the tong bikinis, yeah. Uh, soccer, maybe? OK. This is the American view of Brazil. I understand. It's completely understandable. However, it blinds you to the fact that they have a burgeoning aerospace industry. Do you know that most planes that you fly between regional cities is made and designed in Brazil? 
You're not thinking this because you're still distracted by bikinis. <laughs> Brazil has the third largest aerospace industry in the world, employing 18,000 people. It's a $20 billion industry there, and they invented the first airplane that can fly on alcohol. Brazil.